Hello and welcome, I'm Glenn Fay, Director of Education here at the Centre for Independent Studies. It's clear Australia's schooling outcomes have been disappointing over recent years. Around 4 in 10 Australian 15 year olds don't meet reading proficiency benchmarks in international testing and 1 in 3 fall short of national standards. The decline in student achievement in the international arena has been the steepest and most consistent in the world except for Finland. That's prompted Australian educators and policymakers to often look abroad for inspiration to improve our education system. While many have mistakenly looked to flawed models, an unexpected alternative source for inspiration is the US state of Mississippi. Despite historically ranking as one of the lowest performing states in the country, Mississippi has made remarkable progress over the past decade. After accounting for its demographics, Mississippi's education system now ranks among the highest performing in the entire United States. Its impressive rise has been dubbed the Mississippi Miracle. This transformation didn't occur by chance, but through a dedicated commitment to evidence-based practices, policies and leadership. To learn more about the lessons from the Mississippi Miracle, we're joined by the architect of its reform movement. Carrie Wright is the former Mississippi Superintendent of Education, among the longest serving US state education chiefs in recent decades. Carrie, a warm welcome to the CIS. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. For our Q&A discussion, we'll also be joined closer to home by Dr. Jennifer Buckingham. Jen is Director of Strategy and Senior Research Fellow at Multilit and the Five from Five Project. She's a board member of the Australian Institute for Teaching and School Leadership. Jen, very nice to welcome you back to CIS. Thank you, Glenn. Fantastic to be here. And to, without further ado, I'll hand over now over to you, Carrie. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for uh, for having me. I hope that uh, to give you some bits and pieces about what we did to make it work and then looking forward to your questions because uh, those are always kind of intriguing, particularly for people that want to get into the weeds of how we got it done. Uh, the first thing I'll say, and I, Glenn mentioned it, they they keep dubbing this the Mississippi miracle, and I've been very clear to tell people it's not a miracle. It's a lot of hard work. So uh, it takes a long time and it takes steadfastness, but uh, it's been it's been a delight to see the state of Mississippi grow to the extent that it has. So I'll start with my uh, presentation, if you want to put that on the screen. So part of what we did when I got, I arrived in Mississippi in 2013 and realized that there was a lot of groundwork that needed to be done that had not been done prior to this. So one of the things that we started with was reorganizing the State Department, uh, the State Department of Education, if you will. There was no strategic plan. There was no Office of Literacy. There was no Office of Early Childhood. So we really needed to reorganize in order to be prepared to um, implement the two laws that had been passed. I'm going to talk to you about that in just a second. The standards that we had had been rated as um, horrendous by one organization and worst in the nation by another organization. So we totally rewrote and redid our uh, college and career ready standards in ELA and math, and they are now the most rigorous that Mississippi has ever had. Uh, and then along with that, we had to redo our statewide assessment because the old assessment uh, was not measuring proficiency, actually, although they were telling people they were measuring proficiency. Uh, they were me measuring children that had scored at basic. So we wanted to make sure that the assessment was aligned to the new standards and to the rigor of NAEP, and I'll talk about that as well. Uh, we also had a brand new accountability system. Um, I'm a firm believer that accountability drives behaviors, and we're going to talk about exactly what kinds of things were in that accountability system for both schools and districts with data that's very transparent, collected on a regular basis, and put out for the public to review. And one of the biggest pieces that I think that we were very successful at was building teacher and leader capacity. Um, the State Department had uh, heretofore not really leaned in heavily uh, to support the teachers and leaders across the state. So we provided massive professional development, and I'll talk about that as well, to all teachers, K through three, uh, initially, uh, general ed and special ed, and the leaders of those schools. We have now since moved that really up through grade eight, uh, where literacy is concerned, and then there's other high school reform that we could certainly talk about at another time. 
So two laws I mentioned to you, one was the Early Learning Collaborative Act. That was the first time that Mississippi had ever put any public dollars into early childhood. And that was really a surprise to me because having come from the District of Columbia Public Schools and then from the Maryland Public Schools, we'd had... um, We'd have pre-K for a long time, but they started out with $3 million uh, within the first two years, and they increased that then by um, 2021 to $16 million, and they gave us an additional $20 million uh, in 2022. The Literacy-Based Promotion Act was the first time that there had ever been a focus on literacy in the state, and Mississippi had been 50th for years and years and years. And so it really put a focus on K-3 literacy. And it also started out with nine and a half million dollars. Um, and I very quickly let the legislature know that that really was not going to be sufficient uh, to really raise us to where we needed to be. So they have moved that now to $15 million and they have kept that commitment every single year. So the Early Learning Collaborative Act, these are some of the key um, uh, pieces of it. The, instead of calling them pre-K classes, even though they were high quality you know, early childhood programs, we call them early learning collaboratives. And it was really a partnership between either a school or a Head Start or a child care center. Um, and it also gave us the opportunity to establish our first uh, early childhood office. Uh, once again, we leaned in very heavily. We found out that a lot of the people that were running these, these collaboratives, or quite honestly, other public or private pre-K had really not had a lot of professional development around what does that mean to be of high quality? What does that mean to be developmentally appropriate in pre-K? But the key here is that we opened up our professional development for free to anyone that touched three-year-olds and four-year-olds in the state of Mississippi. And my belief was if we did that and built those programs to be stronger, they would be stronger coming into kindergarten. And so we said, come one, come all, and uh, provided really high quality PD to everybody that touched pre-K kids. We also hired um, family engagement people so that we could then start reaching out to our families so that they would know what is it that I can do at home uh, in order to be successful with my child? How can I keep my child heading in the right direction? So we hired coaches, and I can't say enough about hiring coaches. Coaches was another key strategy of ours built into that building capacity strategy for teachers and leaders. But our coaches work directly with teachers, and so they can observe, they give feedback, Uh, If a school wanted to develop a a school-wide literacy plan, the coach could could do that as well, whether they were in early childhood or whether they were in uh, K through three. Uh, It also gave teachers a chance to really watch their coaches model lessons for them. What does that look like to be doing a really fine lesson, a high-quality lesson in front of four-year-olds? Um, We then went, developed standards. Uh, To be honest with you, we started with our standards in K through 12, but then we backed up and did standards for uh, four-year-olds as well. And then we backed up even further and we got a group of professionals together who dealt with children birth through age three. And so we wanted to develop developmentally appropriate standards, but that they were also aligned to our other standards. So now Mississippi has birth through grade 12 standards. And one thing I should say to you up front, all of these kinds of resources are on our website for you to use. So as I've said to people when I've been talking, please, please go to Mississippi Department of Ed's website, take down whatever it is that you think you can use, take Mississippi's name off of it, stick your district, school, state's name on it, country's name on it, And then put it to use because I had an amazing team that developed some amazing resources. So I would encourage you to um, to take advantage of that. So, as I said, the Literacy Based Promotion Act really focused on uh, reading K through three. Uh, And I believed in and I'm glad Glenn brought this up. I believe in using research based um, methods, research based initiatives and strategies So we adopted the science of reading to be our approach to teaching children to read. There's longitudinal data that supports this. And so we then went about making sure that all of our teachers knew how to teach reading. And I'm going to talk about that in just a second. It also required students to pass a reading test in order to qualify for promotion. Um, There were good cause exemptions that would allow them to be promoted to fourth grade if they did not pass that reading test. But there were um, those were uh, things that we developed to make sure that we were not missing anybody. And we also then had to provide professional development to those fourth grade teachers who may be inheriting children that were still reading below grade level. And I'll talk about that in a second. 
So here's some of the components of our law. Um, number one, we we wanted to train educators statewide. And when I say we, anytime I say we, I'm talking about the Mississippi Department of Education. We put out an RFP for a vendor um, who could then teach all of our teachers the science of reading. And we adopted the letters training. Uh, that we have continued to use and kind of expand on that, to be honest with you, since we've been at it for a number of years, to really focus then more on more of classroom practices. And so that's that's been something that we've we've come alongside our letters training. We hired the coaches, and this is a very key decision here. We had the choice of pushing the money to the districts and say, you hire the coach. And I said, no, we're not going to do that because at that time we had 158 superintendents, 158 districts. And I said, I really need to have ensure that there's going to be quality between all these coaches that are hired. So we at the department hired the coaches and then we deployed them to the lowest performing schools across the state. And I felt that controlled for a quality uh, that they knew their content and they also knew about adult learning theory because not all of your best teachers are necessarily your best coaches. And we wanted to make sure that we hired the very best to work side by side with our teachers. The law also provided a K through three monitoring assessment system. Uh, and that is, is that's given at the beginning of the year, the middle of the year and the end of the year. And that data are those data are fed up to the department. So we're able to really kind of keep track of how children are doing as well as schools having access to that data as well. We required our schools to engage with parents. In fact, there is a piece of the law that says, if your child is struggling in reading, you should receive a letter within the first 30 days of school that says, Carrie's having difficulty in reading, and more importantly, here are the specific strategies we are going to be using with Carrie to make her a better reader. And then those letters are sent home to all parents um, every quarter so that parents are kept apprised at all times of how their children are doing. And as I mentioned, just as we established the Office of Early Childhood, this also allowed us to establish the Office of Education and Reading. I mentioned that about hiring the coaches. I can't say enough about that. Uh, now, Mississippi, to be honest with you, has coaches in literacy, uh, mathematics, early childhood, special education, school improvement, data analysis, and digital literacy. And those are all coaches that we have hired and deployed. And as I said, it was important for us to train special ed and general ed teachers. We've now, as I said, extended that up through grade eight because we started having middle school teachers saying, boy, I could really use that. That's not something that I learned when I was coming on or I learned in college. And our law, even though it was a retention policy, we really focused on prevention and intervention. I did not want people getting hung up with the idea of the, the thought of even being retained. Our idea was to get in early and to prevent any child from having to be retained. We also conducted parent meetings all across the state so that parents would know exactly what was in the law and what they could be expecting from their local schools. We did change the law. We changed it a couple of times. One was the teacher certification. So in 2016, because what we were seeing was we were having a lot of our teachers that were coming from our universities who were not prepared to teach reading on day one. And so we said, we need to make sure that these teachers that are coming out of our EPPs or moving into state um, are, know how to teach the science of reading. So now there is a law that says, if you want your license in the state of Mississippi, you must pass the foundations of reading assessment. We also went back in and amended the law to require educators to create individualized reading plans for students. Now, if a student was a special ed student, and, and was receiving reading special education services, they did not have to fill out this law. But let's assume they were a special ed student receiving special ed services in mathematics, but were struggling in reading, but had not been identified for special ed, then they needed to have um, an individualized reading plan. We also added more around dyslexia. Uh, we were finding a lot of children that were being identified for dyslexia. So now the law requires that all districts conduct four hours of awareness training for dyslexia uh, and making sure that every licensed educator is, is aware of it and all the professionals that work with children know how then to go about identifying and working with children who are dyslexic. One of the biggest moves we made was to raise the bar. And by this, I mean, when the law was, we have a five level system. One is the lowest, five is the highest. Four is proficiency, five is advanced. And all the law said initially when it was written in 2013 was all students had to do was score above the lowest achievement level, meaning 
all they had to do was score above a level one. Well, that wasn't even anywhere close to proficient. So I went back across to the legislature and I said, we need to amend this law. We need to raise that, that passing score. And so we need to put it at um, three or higher. I said, give the districts three years notice. So in 2016, when they passed it, we said, okay, in 2019, it's going to become official that they have to pass with a three or higher. Uh, and that gave them enough time and gave us time to start working with professional development again with all of our teachers uh, to ensure that they were ready for this. And I think that is much closer to proficiency. It wasn't at proficient, but it was something to give, I think, send a signal that we really meant we wanted children to become proficient in reading. We did a lot of, this is a great resource. Um, this is a link to it on our website. But if you go on our website and, and just Google strong readers, you will see a very comprehensive guide for educators to use uh, on evidence-based literacy practices. Uh, it also promotes strong language and literacy acquisition. And it also really um, focuses in on literacy instruction, birth through grade 12. So if you, I would encourage you to use this. We've had a lot of positive feedback uh, from our teachers on this guide itself. We also put up a website for parents called Strong Readers MS. And so we wanted parents to be able to um, go on this website, find activities from birth through grade five on how they could work at home with their children uh, in reading. And this too is on our website. We didn't leave math alone. Uh, we also aligned all of our math content standards to NAEP and the ACT math framework. Um, ACT is one of the college admission uh, tests that a lot of the states in the, in the South particularly use. Uh, we also added a transition to algebra course in our middle schools to better prepare our children because most of the children were taking algebra in grade nine. And the SREB stands for the Southern Region Education Board. They've developed what's called a math ready in high school. So it's really to support students that need that extra intervention. And when we launched that SREB math class, we also then provided our teachers with intense training and professional development on how to really implement that course so that kids could be could feel better prepared. And also lots of uh, regional training for teachers, administrators, and math specialists, and focusing, as you can see, on coherence, progression, and the rigor of the standards. This was new to Mississippi, uh, and so we really had to provide the same amount of equal training that we did with literacy, we also provided with mathematics. Uh, the math coaches, the state funds that we used, uh, supported one full-time math coach director and two regional coaches, but we also then were, we reached out and did an RFP to hire um, a company that could provide coaches but once again, we interviewed and selected the coaches. So even though they said, here's a group of math coaches, <clears throat> we just said, okay, you're not hiring them, we are. So we interviewed those and we had 35 coaches or we had coaches in 35 schools in 21, 22. And currently we've got coaches serving 75 schools. So um, that is um, that has been the one thing when the when the school, the school started getting their literacy coaches, the next thing they asked for is when are we going to get our math coaches? So we're working on that as we speak. Uh, this was something else we developed uh, is called the Mississippi High Quality Instructional Materials Mathematics Rubric. We wanted teachers if they were like pulling something off the internet or they found something at, you know, at a conference, they have a rubric now, this is also on our website, so that you can then in a very quick way, identify whether the materials that you are looking at are of high quality. Do they align to the standards? Are they rigorous? Is it the kind of work that you want putting in front of children? Uh, and so that rubric is on our website. The other thing that we did was we dis we established a high quality instructional materials website. So this is in um, ELA math, science and social studies, all grades and teachers. These have all been curated by by professionals so that we could tell our teachers, look, if you're looking for something and you can't find something, go to our instructional high quality instructional materials website and you might be able to find something there. Click on the grade, click on the subject and you can download those resources. We also have this on our website. We have an instructional planning guide, which kind of gives teachers an idea of how to go about planning for a year for mathematics in all grades. We developed exemplar lesson plans. Uh, we had a grant from the Kellogg Foundation, which is a big philanthropy in Mississippi. Uh, and so they gave us money for teachers to develop exemplar lesson plans, but those are on our website. 
a scaffolding document. We wanted teachers to know that we've got one in ELA and in math. We wanted teachers to know how do I differentiate this when I've got kids of differing levels inside a class? And so that document will help you do that. And we've also got actually a manipulative loan out program. Uh, so if your, your district doesn't have manipulatives, there's a way that you can get your hands on them, uh, no pun intended, um, through this program. And the observation tool, we've got this in math and we've got this in ELA. Sometimes principals just needed some help to know what should I be looking for. So if you open these protocols it will, and you, you're doing a walkthrough as a principal, it will say, this is what you should see teachers doing. This is what you should see students doing. This is the kind of activities that children should be involved in. Uh, and that's been a very popular um, piece of uh, information on our website, too. So here's a little bit about our achievement uh, data. This is um, level two was all they had to score. Remember I said that only just getting over level one. And you can see for those first three years, we did have a lot of kids passing it. But look what happened. We raised the bar and you had almost as many kids passing it. So it was proof positive to us that in 19 <clears throat> and 20 and 22, we had those, our teachers were doing exactly what we wanted them to do because more kids were passing at a higher rate. And um, I'll talk to you a little bit more about that later. So Nate came along. This is um, our scores from 2009, that kind of turquoisey color that you see, all the way to 2022. Um, and as you know, in 2020, uh, we uh, Nate was bumped, uh, actually was bumped from 2021 to 2022 because of COVID. Uh, and this gives you what our scores were um, in, uh, in, in reading and in mathematics. And you can see, I mean, in in reading particularly, but also in mathematics, you know, we kind of held our own with what the nation did. So everybody fell off the cliff in math, no doubt about it. And uh, I know that that's something that they're working very diligently on, as all states are, quite honestly, this particularly those that I'm consulting with, um, are working very diligently to try and figure out the math problem. What is that? Uh, what's going on there? These graphs came from NAEP. Uh, you're able to see very clearly, uh, this is in reading, fourth grade reading, how Mississippi scores were the ones that are down there at the, on the bottom and the national is on the top. Kept climbing and climbing and climbing until 2019. Uh, Mississippi's fourth graders uh, were ranked number one in the nation for our gains in reading uh, uh, and mathematics, quite honestly. Is grade four math, and you see the same thing happening once again in 2022, um, declining, but you can see that that's been a steady, steady rise uh, in mathematics as well. One of the things that I really want to lift up um, right now, uh, our students scored at the national average in both reading and math, but this second bullet and that third bullet are huge for me. Mississippi has the highest rate of poverty in the nation, and in 19 and in 2022, our children in poverty, Mississippi's fourth graders, tied for number one in the country in reading and number two in math. And our children in poverty, be they black, white, or Hispanic, achieved higher scores in reading and math than their peers nationally and in the South. Mississippi is the number two state in the nation for closing the fourth grade reading gap between students of low income and their wealthier peers. So this is proof positive that not only are various um, race and ethnic groups can do well, but children in poverty can do well if they're given the right kind of instruction. So this is our rankings over a 10 year period. Uh, you can see uh, from 2011 to 2022, we are number one in the nation for our gains in fourth grade math and number one in the gains for our, in the nation for our gains in fourth grade reading, and also third in the nation for eighth grade math and seventh in the nation for eighth grade reading. So Quality Counts is a national publication that comes out <clears throat> every year uh, and produces an annual report for every state. And you can see where we were in 2013 and where we were in 2022. And some of the key strategies I've lifted off to the side, uh, and I think I've been speaking about that, obviously, as I've been talking, but we're really proud of the fact that we are no longer 50th. And in the South, there was a saying, thank God for Mississippi. Because the thank God for Mississippi meant we, they didn't have to worry about being at the bottom. Mississippi was always going to be at the bottom. And so now my colleagues in the South are saying, well, we can't say that anymore because right now Mississippi is 35th in the nation ranked by quality counts and 21st in the nation 
for our ranking um, around our, our growth in, in reading. I'm going to speak about this very quickly because it's a retention piece and people ask a lot of question, questions about retention. These are the percentages of children that were retained. Uh, one thing that you need to do know is that sometimes these also, these percentages contain children that were also retained, let's say by a parent or that even they may have passed the third grade, but just a, a school decided to retain them retain them anyway. This was a study that was just recently produced um, by Boston University. It's their uh, We Like Educational Policy Center. They took our first cohort of students that were retained uh, and they and the students that were promoted to fourth grade. Obviously, those who were promoted, which also included, remember, your good cause exemption children, and they followed them all the way through sixth grade. And they found that by sixth grade, the students that were retained had substantial and sustained literacy gains on their ELA scores compared to those who were promoted. And those gains were significant among African-American and Hispanic students. And the other thing that I thought was really critical, that third bullet, it did not impact special education identification, which is significant, and it did not impact um, absenteeism. So uh, this was a big study that the nation really, I think, kind of took um, their eyes to because everybody, there's a lot of back and forth about is retention worth it? Is it not worth it? And this is one of the studies that really actually followed our children uh, to say, yeah, actually um, it really did work. All right. So Glenn, I hope I've done that in the time that you wanted me to do it. <laughs> and uh, I'm turning it back over to you. Carrie, thanks for sharing all your insights there through that discussion. I think there was a lot for us to unpack there. Uh, can I get you to uh, outline for us what got the momentum in the first place? Because it's really difficult in, in school systems anywhere in the world to first accept that there's a, a significant opportunity to do better and that, that there is a, a need to invest in doing so. How did you get that across the line uh, when you first started this journey? Well, it's interesting because when I first got to Mississippi, I really discovered just a culture of low expectations. I think that I don't, I think people had lost hope. I think people had just simply lost hope that our children were capable of doing what they were capable of doing. And I think the passage of those two pieces of legislation and our amendments to those two pieces of legislation um, made people sit up and take notice. I mean, now the, the the legislature was saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know, we've got to do something about this and in a strong way. What I really appreciated was that they allowed the implementation up to me and they, they didn't try to tell me then how to do it. And so I think with us leaning in around the science of reading, us leaning in on the building capacity of teachers and leaders, us leaning in with our coaching strategy, and then building those high expectations, high standards, an assessment that was aligned to that, and being very transparent about our data. And I did not mention that enough. We are very transparent about our data. But it was also important to me that even when the data came out, that we also provided professional development to teachers on how to use the data, how to interpret the data. So, um, and you stick to it. It's year after year after year and being very public, celebrating when we can celebrate, but being very public about the progress that we we're making. And I think that made a difference. And Jen, I'd like to bring you in to give us a more Australian-based context. And you've worked in systems really right around the country. We've we've heard a bit about the before and the after in Mississippi. Do, does there any resemblance to you in in the systems that you see in across Australia, Jen? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> Congratulations, Carrie, on um, incredible progress um, in what probably some people think would be a seems like a short space of time, but it was really 20 years, wasn't it, you know, of um, of groundwork and then hard policy work. Uh, we, we have, I guess, a, a resemblance to, um, you know, the pre-reform um, situation in Mississippi in the Northern Territory, you know, very high levels of disadvantage, high proportions of students um, who are Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, um, and very low literacy in a lot of places. And so that is probably, you know, that one of the contexts that, um, you know, th these lessons could be applied and learned and where there's the most potential for um, some improvement in terms of, you know, post-Mississippi um, reforms or really in the midst of them, they're not over, are they? It's, it's, it's not a set and forget. <laughs> there's there's right. still a, a lot to do um, and, you you know, got to keep that work up. But South Australia is probably the closest state in terms of, you know, making some progress towards those goals and, and some policies that mirror 
those that were implemented in Mississippi, so um, introduction of a, um, an assessment, no stakes attached to that, no, no retention um, sorts of outcomes or decisions around those assessments, um, and a bipartisan approach. Mm -hmm. that, um, and that, that was really important in South Australia and they implemented something called the Literacy Guarantee Unit, which a little bit like in Mississippi, you know, had um, coaches, um, people who went, went out to work in schools that were employed by the state government and, you know, were uh, very knowledgeable. Um, and so we can see a difference there than uh, to somewhere like New South Wales where instructional leaders that were deployed into schools from the state government just didn't have that same level of knowledge. Um, to take into school. So they were they were supposedly coaching and, and helping um, schools to improve their literacy teaching, but, you know, there was no uh, assurance that they had the knowledge um, around evidence-based practices to be able to do that effectively. And that's really the key piece, isn't it, having the knowledge to, be, to impart, um, and that's going to make all the difference. A really good point, because the one thing that we did not assume we did not assume that anybody knew how to do this uh -huh. because I thought if somebody, if they'd known how to do it, they would have done it. And so that's the reason we provided the professional development that we did to our principals and our teachers, because we wanted to make sure that they had the skills with which to do that work. Mm. And Jen, you've, you've um, uh, of course, had a lot to do with the, the introduction of a lot of the literacy guarantee work over in South Australia. Uh, can you share with us a little bit about some of the progress in its early years of implementation, including the phonics screening check? Yeah, certainly. Um, and it had a similar pr approach to Mississippi, you know, introduced um, this new assessment, but didn't assume that teachers would know how to improve their instruction based on the assessment. You can't just sort of set a target and then say, go for it, um, because the consequences of that then do land on students rather than, um, you know, having the improvement that you'd like to see. So there was uh, a lot of professional development. Um, included as part of that unit. So a lot of upskilling of the people within the unit as well as people in schools. Uh, and as a result of that, there have been improvements on the phonics screening check. So I'm talking the assessment I referred to as a U1 assessment um, of decoding skills specifically. And there's been an improvement, about 15 percentage point improvement over a couple of year period, which is pretty good. Still a quite a long way to go. Things have sort of plateaued a bit now. So which just is another reminder that the work is never finished. Um, you've got to keep going and there's still some, some work to be done there. But it's evidence that, that you can get an impact when the reform settings are right. Carrie, you highlighted the science of reading several times during your, your comments. Uh, is there a role here that's been played by the, uh, that broader movement? Now, I understand that 30 or more US states have now enacted laws aligned with the science of reading. Uh, to what extent does that help accommodate the work that you were doing in Mississippi? Well, I think it was significant because I think once we were producing the results we started to produce and people started paying attention to it, it was like, well, what are you doing differently? Because the educator prep programs were not preparing our children, or our students, or excuse me, our teachers to know how to read. And, and a lot of them had been using a, a, an approach in the United States called balanced literacy. And balanced literacy had absolutely no longitudinal data to support it. So one of the things that we wanted was we wanted a program that we knew had the data behind it that said, no, there is a way to teach children how to read. Um, and so that's why we we selected the science of reading. And that's why a lot of other states around the nation, I think it's up to 35 now, Glenn, that have, uh, that have implemented literacy laws. And Jen, how do you, you've, you've advised ministers all over Australia and, and departments, how well across uh, the science of reading do you think Australian policymakers are? Yeah, well, to be clear, they don't always take my advice, so I'm not going to take <laughs> responsibility for um, the things that, are, that aren't going well. Um, it's really patchy. You know, we at least have um, our national institutions now um, do uh, have policy guidance and curricular documents that um, and, and practice guides and so on that are evidence-based, particularly the Australian Educational Research Organisation, but also, you know, our, our national curriculum now is better and um, some of our accreditation standards for teachers, you know, and for ITE, you know, hopefully moving in the right direction. Um, but at the state level, yeah, it is it is patchy and, and even sort of within states, 
um, you couldn't say that it's consistent. Some are doing a better job than others, um, but in some states it's, they're still really holding on to that balanced literacy approach that Kerry just mentioned, which is, you know, a, a kind of nebulous definition, which is part of the problem. Mm -hmm. um, because no one really knows what it is. It's this it's sort of an idea of an approach, but uh, for teachers, it doesn't really give them um, the strategies that they need to be able to teach effectively. That's right. That's exactly right. So, Carrie, on that, while we are talking uh, around early reading and particularly science of reading approaches, uh, Mark in the questions has asked us if Mississippi used a specific synthetic phonics program across its schools. Um, we we are curriculum agnostic. Let me say that very clearly, right? Um, and we we did that deliberately. We are standards based. We have been very clear about that, like making sure that this, the state standards are are taught and making sure that the five components of the science of reading are taught. But we've not said purchase this one or purchase that one. Uh, what we have put on our website uh, that you'll see are those that um, there's a organization called Ed Reports that evaluates um, curriculum nationally. It's a very rigorous evaluation. And they will then either label a curriculum green, red, or yellow, um, depending on, on what it turns out after their evaluation. And they are now getting ready to undertake um, a whole look, a different look at this around the science of reading because so many people are asking for that. Um, and so we wanted to make sure these are the five components you need to be teaching. Our professional development will teach you how to do that, but have, which which curriculum piece you choose to buy, that is really up, left up to the local. And Carrie, before we um, before we talk more about the teacher workforce and the professional development piece, I, I'm just borrowing a few questions that have come through within our, the the chat here, which ask about the objections from some stakeholders, and and I can suspect in some cases that might include some teachers unions, and I'm interested in your position, whether that was your experience, uh, but also potentially parent groups in the case of retention of students that that uh, maybe, maybe parents wanted to see their children moving through. Did the How did you work with some of those objections that might have been there and, and, and uh, persuade all parties that, that the policy was the right way to go? Well, number one, Mississippi is a right to work state, so there are no unions in Mississippi at all, whether it's teacher or other. <laughs> um, so that that was a, a part of what we weren't having <clears throat> to deal with. But there was some skepticism. I, I honestly think about that, particularly for those teachers that were so grounded in balanced literacy and is like, why do I need to do something differently? <clears throat> but the assessment was going to be assessing whether or not these kids knew that. And so, um, you know, that's a piece of it that I think was, was very important. And I think once the teachers went through the professional development, I can honestly tell you that almost all the teachers that came out of that said it was the best professional development they had ever been to. And now they understood what it meant to teach reading. Like it was like the light bulb went off. Um, and also I think with parents, we went around the state telling parents, here's what the law says. Um, here's what you could be doing at home. Um, that's the reason we created those websites that you saw, you know, in my presentation so that they could be helpful at home. But there was really no, <coughs> excuse me, getting around the retention piece. Um, that's why we focused so heavily on prevention and intervention, because we wanted to try and get in and intervene early so that we just prevent the, the whole retention piece altogether. Jen, in recent times, there's been a, a large discussion here in Australia about uh, early screening, intervention, including small group tutoring and so on. Um, less discussion about retention, but, but Jen, do you think we're, we're reaching a point where we're better informed in, in practice about how to approach early intervention? Yeah, I think it's getting there. I think intervention, um, once reading recovery um, retreated <laughs> gradually um, over a long period of time. I, I think there was a um, a movement towards more effective interventions, but unfortunately, unless you get the the tier one, the whole class instruction right, you're going to have far too many students who need intervention, and it's such a strain on resources. Um, and so, the best best thing to do is try and get that um, initial instruction as high quality as possible. And I think you know that. That's got to be where some focus is as well. Um, in terms of retention, you know, I, I think um, even even I'm a little bit uncomfortable about the retention, and I'd be seen probably as um, a hardliner on these kinds of things. But it's um, having looked at what happened in Mississippi, you can't really deny, you know, 
um, how important that has been as part of that the overall piece. And the important thing is that it's not just the only thing. If it were the only thing, then it would be a different story altogether. Um, I I do think that in Australia we have accepted a too higher rate of um, of low literacy. That there's just been this idea that you know this is just how it is that that we can't improve on this, um, and it's absolutely not true. Um, you know that they're, they're, that setting um, higher expectations and then you know really really everyone working consistently and hard to to make sure they're achieved um, is is really important uh, in terms of, you know, having those consequences around and around accountability. Um, you know, that's a, another discussion, but it seems to me as though, you know, we're sort of at a place now um, where it's hard to get reform without some sort of stakes involved. We, we're the only state that does have that was, is WA with the ULNA. But that's at the end of compulsory schooling, which is too late. You know, it, it has to, it will, it does work its way back down the line. Um, but it's, it's not at the right point. New South Wales tried to do something like that a couple of years ago. I want to say a couple, five or six years ago, I guess. Um, but it only lasted a year or two. You know, it just it was dumped by the next minister. So we really don't have a good history of having stakes. Um, attached to our assessments, um, you know, maybe it's time for systems to consider that. And Jen, just for, for Carrie's benefit, in recent times, our NAPLAN assessments, uh, the literacy and numeracy uh, uh, census assessment that, that all students complete in years three, five, seven and nine, introduced new standards. And, and these are uh, now against, a, 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 generally speaking, a, a tougher standard. Uh, what role do you think that plays in in helping to uh, deliver that well, the, the kind of expectations that that Carrie highlighted in terms of the, changing the proficiency expectation of students in primary? Yeah, I mean, in, improving the standards or the expected standard is um, important. Um, because it sort of removes that complacency and um, we, we had a very low national minimum standard benchmark uh, and allowed uh, us to coast along thinking that 95% of kids were achieving a high level or a reasonable level at least of, of, um, of literacy and it was, was, wasn't was the case. Um, and so having the achievement uh, expected achievement level set an appropriate standard you know, low and early enough in schooling so it doesn't become a, a, a shock uh, at the end where you have lots of students who aren't achieving the standard, um, gives systems something to work towards. It's got to be realistic better, but ambitious, but more importantly for teachers to have the skills and the knowledge to be able to achieve those standards. Otherwise, it's it's unfair on everybody. Carrie, I've Carrie, I've received questions in, in the box from Jerry and Michael. Both are very interested in the, the impressive results, particularly for disadvantaged students, but also curious about the way that the retention policy worked. Um, obviously, it, it is one that, that, as Jen points out, is a, probably quite a controversial uh, uh, effort if, if introduced here in Australia. But can you tell us a little bit more about how that, how that worked in, in practice, uh, how, how it was applied in schools? So we used our um, spring assessment, our statewide assessment, as the third grade assessment. And then um, it's an ELA assessment. So we, the vendor pulls the, um, the, the language arts pieces out of it, if you will, and then rates the reading. And that, that usually is back to a school within, it's usually a pass-fail, uh, very quickly, back to a school within five days. So a teacher and schools will know Here's the list of kids that passed. Here's the list of the kids that didn't. So that gives them intervention time till the end of the school year. Um, and then the assessment is administered again. And then those children that don't pass then have the entire summer of summer help. And then in August, the last assessment is given. And if they don't pass it, then, um, then they are retained. Um, now, that being said, what we also built into this was the, because uh, I said the last thing a third grader that's being retained needs is just another year of the same thing. So we said, no, they've got to have a reading plan. They've got to have a 90 minute block guaranteed of, you know, intense reading instruction. So there were a lot of other things that were built into those third graders that got retained. But likewise, 
for the kids that got promoted, maybe just barely got promoted or got promoted for good cause exemption, you now had all these fourth grade teachers that were inheriting children that were still reading below grade level. So we then had to provide professional development or, to our fourth grade teachers to say, okay, here's how you can address reading difficulties of children that are reading below fourth grade level. So it was a way to help both ends, both to help third grade, third grade teachers, but also to help fourth grade teachers who were also um, having to instruct children um, that were below grade level. So I'd like to touch on uh, the, the teacher workforce and the development piece uh, on the on the personnel side there. And Carrie, you spoke a bit about the the role of coaches and, and how important coaches were. Can you tell us a bit about how coaches were identified, how schools and, and targets were identified for coaching, and, and how you got the teachers on board with, with welcoming and supporting that extra uh, support? Well, we we advertised, we developed a job description, and then uh, we uh, held a very rigorous interview pro process, um, and uh, then selected what we felt were. Uh, it was looking, as I said, both at the content knowledge area of the science of reading, and also their ability to demonstrate how do you work with adults. Um, and so we then hired. Uh, the legislature was expecting us to come out with about 75 coaches right off the bat, and we didn't because we were not going to um, – we weren't going to give on quality. I mean, we could have had the quantity, but we wouldn't have the quality. So we started out with 25, uh, and we eventually ended up – I think the most we ever had was 85. But then we used our data where, as where to assign them. So those schools that had the worst results in uh, in reading were where we started – first and we just worked our way from the bottom up like so some coaches were there uh were shared between two schools some were there full time some schools depending on the size and depending on the number of children we had like one and a half coaches so we tried to differentiate that based on who they had to work with but the other important thing that we did we then provided professional development to our coaches once a month and that goes that has been faithful all coaches in their content area are brought in once a month for their own professional development uh, so that they can go back and be even better. I did have a principal when we first started deploying it. He was not happy that we had chosen the coach and he didn't have any input. And he said, I don't need a coach was his response to me. And I said, have you looked at your data? I said, because, you know, the data were not inaccurate. I mean, his school was one of the lowest performing schools in the state. And so I said, you just need to give it a shot. And once the coaches got in and the teachers realized they're not evaluative, they don't give any feedback to the principal on good, better, or best. They're there to work side by side as a colleague, unevaluative, in order to be able to boast, boast, boost the teacher's skill sets. And so the the teachers fell in love with them. I mean, they loved having a coach come to their school because it was a great way. It was like your own job embedded professional development. And, um, which is exactly what it was intended to do, which is what the research again says works best is job embedded. So um, it, we had it both ways. We had the professional development that caused them to come out of the school, but we also had the job embedded piece with the coaches. And so I can tell you that once the coaching the the message about coaching spread around the state. Everybody was saying, when do I get a coach? When do I get a coach? And so, uh, and they're so good at what they do and they're so gracious um, and very humble people, but they are so smart and so talented. Jen, over here in Australia, how how do we stack up when it comes to the, the mentoring, professional development and coaching within schools? It's um, It's not done very consistently and... Um, I, I can't really think of a state where there is like a really sort of strong coaching model in the way that Kerry's described, you know, the, the literacy guarantee, you know, I mentioned earlier in South Australia is probably one model of that. Um, and I know the schools in, that that I have um, spent time in, in South Australia are really grateful in the same way that Kerry just described, really work well, really appreciate um, the input and the advice from the coaches. They feel as though it's a partnership. Um, they're working together to do that. Um, in in other states, I, I don't think it's been as effective uh, and I don't necessarily know that it's as well understood, particularly in the way um, that Kerry mentioned of, of understanding how to, you know, work with adults as learners, so not just to be good teachers and to know the content but actually how to um, work with other people in, in order to elevate their practice as well. So it's a really specific 
skill set. And actually, I think it would be quite difficult to find um, to find people to fill those roles, at least to begin with. You know, it's the sort of thing that, you know, starts difficult, Get hopefully, you know, as it builds up steam, gets a little bit easier. But I think it, to begin with in Australia, that might be hard to find enough to, to cover all schools. And Carrie, we'll run out of time soon, but I, I wanted to uh, I wanted to get a sense of the teacher's knowledge test that, that you highlighted earlier. You described as the foundations of reading assessment. Here in Australia, we uh, we test teachers upon graduation or prior to graduation or prior to accreditation, technically, uh, on their literacy and numeracy skills. Uh, Carrie, can you tell us a bit more about the the test that, that you've described about science of reading? Yeah, yeah, we put an RFP out actually um, for a test for teachers, uh, and I believe this is a Pearson product. Um, but the Foundations of Reading was the one that the evaluators. I think we had three different ones submitted, and this is the one that they chose. Uh, the Foundations of Reading has also gone back in and um, ch actually changed some of the things inside that reading exam based on a lot of the the data that that were collected. But we also have started producing the results by educator prep program. So uh, because what we found happening was that it's taking some teachers six and seven times till they pass this test. And that wasn't what we needed to know. We needed to know how many could pass it on the first try, because that would then give you the evidence that they knew exactly what they, they needed to know to come in and teach. And so um, that hasn't been very popular. <laughs> um, but uh, that being said, um, you need to be honest about it. You can't just say, sure, we're doing it, and then have your, your graduates come in and not even able to take a test and pass it to get their license. So um, I think it's it, I think it's sent a message too. Like the legislature sent a message too to you know the institutions of higher learning that no, this is serious business. Like this is these are children's lives that we're impacting. And I I, I don't think we can say enough about that. This isn't just about adults and and the adults that are involved, this is about your nation's future. And so I just feel so strongly that that's our job. Our job is to be out there doing the best that we can for all children, regardless of their zip code or their location in the state. You know, we've got an area in our state called the Delta, and it is it is abject poverty. It is generational poverty. And um, but those kids are out there learning. In fact, one of the districts that we took over uh, that was very, wasn't in the Delta, but it was in a very, very poor performing area of the state. That new superintendent that we put in place took that that school from an F to a C and he's done it in two years. And that is an, on a very rigorous accountability system. We have an A through F system. So it can be done, but you've got to stick to it and you've got to have the right the right person at the helm in those schools. Jen, we've been talking about teacher preparation programs here in Australia for years and, and the need for improvement. There have been some developments in the last six months or so that, that are likely to, to help move in the right direction. When we've looked at uh, reading instruction in the past, and, and of course your work has also highlighted this, Jen, uh, that many universities, regardless of whether you change requirements upon them uh, to include science of reading units, doesn't necessarily mean it's delivered with efficacy. Jen, do we think we need a test of the students to, to ensure that the programs are delivering what's promised? I would love to see that. <laughs> um, and the idea of, of publishing um, the first time pass rate is just um, quite an exciting prospect. Um, I just want to refer back to something that Kerry said earlier about getting um, assessment results back to school in five days. Is that what you said? Wow. Well, that's on the third grade assessment. Now, yes, the I mean. light assessment doesn't come in until the end of June. So that's a little bit longer for the for the entire assessment. But the pass fail comes back within five days. Amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, that's another another piece that, that we could be better at, getting results of assessments back to schools more quickly. Um, in terms of teacher prep, yeah, you know, this has been an ongoing problem in Australia for quite a long period of time, um, recent review um, and uh, an expert panel put forward some suggestions in terms of mandating some core content. So, um, you know, along the lines that of the, the core content around literacy um, that have been impl implemented in Mississippi, you know, it's, it's going to be a bit of a battle uh, to get that across. In terms of a licensing exam, we've got no kind of um, tradition of that 
in Australia, whereas I, I believe that in Mississippi there was a licensure, licensure process and so it was a matter of changing the exam to be, you know, better reflective of what you wanted the course content to be. So we'd have to um, bring in, you know, that that licensure process, you know, through the teacher education regulation authorities in each state and territory to begin with so that we've got another step kind of ahead of that before we could we could get there but I do think it's an important part of that um show us don't just tell us what you're doing you need to show us that it, it, you're actually producing graduates who who know this um this content at the moment we're in this bit of an impasse of where uh, teacher education programs say yes of course we cover this this content that you're talking about and also how dare you tell us we should cover this content that you're talking about um and so you know I'm I am instinctively not in favor of over regulatory approaches but sometimes you know there's a circuit breaker that's required and you know mandating some core content having some sort of um assessment um for graduation seems like it, it might be the next step and we are just about out of time, and I do want a final question for for both of our panelists. And and uh, I'll go first to to you, Carrie, and then over over to Jen. But uh, Carrie, if there's one thing that Australian policymakers could take away from the experience in Mississippi, what would it be? Well, I do believe you got to have strong policy in place, and I think we started that with the two pieces of legislation. There's no doubt about that. That sent a very powerful message that. Um, the state was taking it very seriously. The legislature was taking it very seriously. Um, but then making sure that when you're implementing, you got strong research-based um, pieces that you're putting in place. You know, it's not good enough to throw everything up against the wall and see what sticks, because I believe that you're dealing with children's lives. And so you need to be relying on what does the research say that is the best approach. So I think using research strategies building the capacity of your teachers and leaders to do this because not all of them come to the table with the same skill sets. I think uh, making sure you've got the highest standards you can possibly have in place. And Jen is right, an assessment that's aligned to that, which we did not have. And then a strong accountability system. I mean, you've got to have a way to hold people accountable for what's going on in the school day. And so um, those would be the biggest pieces that I would say um, and the right people. I mean, I've got an amazing team, had an amazing team that believed the same things I did. And so you've got to have a team that's willing to lean in hard, not only your own leadership team, but across the entire department that was just believing that we could do this and make it work. Jen, what, what do we take for Australia from Mississippi? Yeah, I guess Kerry said earlier it wasn't a miracle. It was it was really hard work. It wasn't as though parents woke up one morning and suddenly all their kids could read. It <laughs> happened over a really long period of time, but it was really consistent. Um, and it was it was layered, you know. So it was building one after the other. There were things were evaluated, which I think was um an important part of the process is where research was done to make sure that things were working as planned. If not, then what needs to be uh rejigged, tweaked. Um, done differently in order to make that more effective, but just this consistent sort of working towards a goal. Um, and then I guess finally that, um, you know, these are not kind of new things that have come out of the blue. You know, these are, um, are policy reforms that we understand and we know about. It's been about the implementation and, and the will and the strength, strong leadership um, and keeping children at the centre of the decisions that are made. Um, which is really important and that, you know, poverty doesn't have to be an obstacle, that, you know, that those evidence-based approaches are not less important for those students. It's not as though this is just a, you know, approach that just works with certain kids in, you know, advantaged areas. This is an approach that is essential for children in disadvantaged circumstances and you can have an impact. It, you know, it's, it's, I guess that's the, the message that there is hope. Well, that's a very good place to end <laughs> for us. And that is uh, unfortunately all we have time for. I'm sure we could have talked for hours about this and perhaps we will again sometime. Uh, from everyone here at the CIS, a big thanks uh, to you, Carrie, and also Jen for, for your time and your insights. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks. It's nice to meet you. Now, for decades, CIS has been a fiercely independent voice, working tirelessly to deliver evidence-based public policy, especially in the critical area of education. To be notified of our future videos, make sure you subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell. 
CIS relies solely on the generosity of people like you to help us advance our cause. Check out the links on screen now to see how you can get involved.